and welcome to Zen Live TV. This is Jeremy Riss, your host, uh, the alien scientist. Um, views and opinions expressed on this program, as always, are not necessarily endorsed by our producers or by the guests we have on from week to week. We talk about a lot of different controversial subjects in the fields of science and technology, and not everyone's going to agree on everything all the time. There are a lot of issues that arise and a lot of disagreements, so just understand that um, it's not the fault of our producers or the guests we have on from week to week. And my opinions change as well. So uh, we're, we're here using the scientific method to try and understand our universe and try and learn new things and have new insights into the universe that we live in. And um, basically, um, today's program, we're going to be talking about a kind of a continuation of the past two weeks. Um, we, we talked a lot about Tesla and really his life legacy and, and a lot about electromagnetism and the laws of uh, physics and involved in the electromagnetic field. Um, and my uh, guest Ken Griggs um, will be joining us again today, and as he as he did the last uh, three or four programs, and um, and he'll be skyping in with us shortly. Uh, today we're going to be talking more more so about um, quantum physics rather than um, elect we did electromagnetism pretty thoroughly on the uh, the last two episodes. All right, I need to add someone to this call. Sorry. Um, sorry, I I I, uh, I meant to meant to put a person in on the call, and uh, we ended up dropping the call. So I'm going to try and merge these calls now. And um, I I didn't know why that didn't work correctly, but I'm going to get Ken with us. He was calling in, and it must have dropped his uh, add to group call. That's why I didn't click. All right, there we go. I, I forgot to click add to group call, I, and I dropped uh, I dropped our producer. So, sorry. Oh no. Sorry about that. Uh, anyways, um, to, we in the last episode uh, of of um, with on mostly on Tesla and stuff, we covered a lot of the stuff on uh, electromagnetic field theory, um, the laws of physics that Tesla understood in order to invent what he did and uh, to come up with the inventions that that he uh, came up with in his lifetime and uh, sort of the theory. And how the theory has evolved from Tesla's day and sort of uh, into modern times, and um, didn't really get into too much about uh, a lot of Tesla's autobiographical work and a lot of the stuff that he wrote. He he was a he was kind of like pursued a lot of free energy inventions and stuff, and I uh, I didn't really talk about that subject. I, I, of course, there all the free energy machines that he built. He realized that they weren't free energy. He built a uh, he built several and found out that there was a leak in the pressure of the one thing that was causing the uh, rotation and, and not just a, a perpetual motion. And uh, But he was always trying to look for those things. He wrote about those things a lot. And uh, some of the theory and ideas that he had um, sort of give us an idea of what, you know, sort of the paths that other people have tried that, that – um, you know what not to do, or so to speak, in 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 a, in a lot of ways. But in in addition to the great contributions that he did make, and um, that we talked about in those last two episodes with uh, electromagnetic field theory, Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law of induction, uh, Ampere's law, Maxwell's corrections to you know those laws of physics, and some of the other corrections that came later with people like Jeffimenko, and also with uh, Feynman and Dirac. Um, with uh, quantum chromodynamics and and um, merging uh, electromagnetism with the weak nuclear force, um, but today we're going to talk a lot about um, quantum physics. Sort of this, uh, what some physicists describe it as as uh, as a neat neat article. I'll, I'll link to in the description um, that I recently read, and and it, why quantum mechanics is an embarrassment to um, modern science or, or or something like that, or modern physics. And it's sort of uh, this this strange history um, about quantum mechanics. There's a uh, um, Max Born wrote a, a really not interesting paper on the, sort of the the history of quantum mechanics from his perspective. That that's a really good. I'll, I'll link to that in the description um, that you can read. Um, his sort he sort of lived through it all and sort of saw how it all sort of came together from de Broglie figuring out that uh, there was a wave function that um, 
you know, light obeyed this sort of wave function and that uh, other things obeyed this sort of wa wave-like properties as well. And um, then expanding upon upon that with a lot of other work like Max Planck and um, even Einstein with his, I think his one of his first papers on the photoelectric effect, um, which is how uh, photovoltaic panels work by incoming photons knocking off electrons and then getting um, electrical electrical energy uh, and out of that potentials. Um, this is a good book that I read. Uh, it's a it's a great. Um, it's a great one. It's by George Gamow. It's called 30 Years That Shook Physics, and it's the story of quantum theory. It's, a, it's an excellent, um, short, really small, easy to understand book, not a lot of equations, but this would, this would be a good one. I, you could probably pick up for uh, under 10 bucks uh, is what I paid from Dover um, Publishing. And um, this book you can pick up for under 10 bucks. It's a great read. It's, it's real simple. Um, probably uh, ignore from page 172 on it's sort of this stupid play that's sort of dumb and uh, it's not worth reading but the rest of it's really cool it gives you an interesting introduction to um, the sort of the history of the and the development of quantum theory and um, and and also like it doesn't really give you the perspective on where it is today uh, I think you'll need modern physics and some other classes and, and stuff and and even even some of the more advanced uh, graduate level stuff that, that that we're going to talk about in the second half of the program today, um, like string theory and M theory, brain theory, uh, and those those types of new new cutting edge interpretations of quantum mechanics, and some of those just outstanding questions that we still have in quantum mechanics, and things that just don't sit well with me. I, I that we'll talk about, like uh, for instance, when Richard Feynman uh, graduated from Princeton, his uh, with his PhD, his dad asked him. Okay, so where does the photon come from when, when uh, during photon emission in, a, in an atom? So basically, in, inside of atoms, what happens is uh, a photon will come in and it will knock the electron. The electron will absorb it and jump to a higher energy level. It will jump to a higher orbital state. And then sometime, period of time later, um, it will spontaneously drop back down. And out of nowhere, another photon will pop out of, uh, as this electron drops down from it, its shell and, and uh, it sort of no one's ever been able to explain where that photon comes from, how these fields sort of collapse in order to create that photon or spit it out. But um, I've talked about this and, and theories revol revolving around this in, in a couple of my past videos and stuff, especially with the uh, Franks and Ardsick stuff, um, the theory that uh, that there's this innate structure related to the fine structure constant where whereby it's sort of an impedance match where it slows down the velocity of light similar to the way the way that light slows down when it, it enters water or enters another type of medium where the actual speed of light will slow down to where the actual uh, wavelengths of the light and the and the uh, frequency of the light can actually interact with the mechanical frequencies of the electron cloud the electron structure so that there's this sort of impedance match between the photon and between this mechanical uh, um, resonating mechanical waves or sound waves, if you want to think of them, them as that, um, it's a better way of it's a different way of visualizing it. Though it can't really be classified as sound waves because they're not being transmitted through the same medium that sound is. But um, the whole idea that there's this sort of uh, slowing down of light that it enters this fine structure constant that it slows down to two over 137 times the speed of light or or, uh, or what what have you, and that as that when that when light slows down to that to that speed it's able to match the impedance of the electron and that's sort of Franks and Ardsick's theory of it but um I don't know I always thought that these these interpretations were interesting because uh the way I learned quantum mechanics in um college the my teacher um we used Griffith's uh introduction to quantum mechanics that was the book we used um I think I got a picture of it here in the folder it's it's uh it's the blue book with the cat on it if you want to show that real quick, it's just quantum mechanics. That's a standard um, academic text for uh, quantum physics courses in most universities. Um, but uh, the way my professor sort of uh, described it is don't ask all these theoretical or in insightful questions about the true nature of the universe and the true nature of quantum mechanics. Just shut up and calculate. And basically, you, you know, we went over Schrodinger and um, and learning just how to use Schrodinger equation to basically shut up and calculate and predict, uh, you know, things like the hydrogen atom spectral emissions or, or, uh, or um, just particles in a box, a particle in a, in a 1D well, particle in a three-dimensional box. Uh, and there are different um, interpretations, uh, uh, different problems that you, basic problems that you uh, go through and learn and to solve in, in, in quantum uh, 
physics, introductory quantum, in, introductory quantum mechanics or quantum physics. But um, there's other books on it. I have some of the ones I've read here. Uh, this was a real interesting one, um, QED by Feynman. I'm sure, you've read that one, Ken. Yes, absolutely. And um, we're going to be talking about some of that stuff with path integrals and sort of this whole Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. I also have a, a Shams outline guide for quantum mechanics. It just just basically shows you how to run math equations for Schrodinger for all the basic problems that you have to solve and <clears throat> on all your exams for quantum and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> real not insightful and beyond just uh, shut up and calculate uh, type of approach. But um, you know that that's an interesting it's an interesting uh, thing as we, me and Ken were talking about a little bit before the show. We were we were kind of getting into some of this stuff and uh, I want to recapture some of that good material we had. Um, you were saying you were saying basically uh, Ken about like how it, it is this sort of uh, what is quantum mechanics about? Quantum mechanics is about measurements and it's yes. about it's about making predictions about what we measure and what we uh, what we can actually get out of experiments. Uh, things yes. like the double slit experiment, things like uh, um, Michelson Morley or who, what have you. This this so basically, continue on, continue on that note and talk, okay. talk a little bit about measurement and um, what why we have quantum mechanics, what the theory is, and how it was sort of developed, and maybe a little bit of history and stuff. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, quantum mechanics is our best attempt at figuring out why things do what they do, which basically means that quantum mechanics' only intent is measurement. How do we, in a mathematical way, predict? measurements. Now, we thought we had something great going on uh, in the last, in the 19th century. You know, we had electrodynamics, we had, um, um, you know, all of Newton's work, gravity, et cetera, et cetera. So we thought we had it going on. But we realized, oh my gosh, we, we really don't understand how things like black body radiation, you know, when, when you're actually holding something up to a flame and then you let it out of the flame and you see it die down you know what what's going on with that what's the radiation look like we didn't understand it we had two laws they were incompatible and they didn't predict the whole phenomenon and then max planck you know ushers up a new idea he didn't like it but he knew that this new idea called uh planck's constant actually fixed the the theoretical framework that would allow us to make or, or, or show that this mathematical entity actually predicts what we see when you you know pull that hot poker out of the fire. Right. So Planck black hated body it. radiation. Black and body radiation. That's right. So so what you find through the course of, of quantum mechanics is that as people realize that they need it, they hate having to do it. Okay. There's something that just rubs us the wrong way. But what you find is is they're basically saying, look, the mathematics has to predict what we're seeing in reality. And this is the only mathematics that we know of so far that can seemingly do that. And the mathematics, you know, gets developed over time. So we go from quantum so, mechanics. Yeah. Let's talk about this a little bit. So so basically they, they were burning um, elements in a, in a candle in, or in flames and, and showing that they had these lines of spectral emissions that That's they right. were detecting. That's and right. um, that there is these discrete lines. They didn't just co co emit a continuous spectrum, that they emitted That's things on these discrete levels. So That's Planck right. sort of came up with this idea of a a quantum, a, a quantized um, – discrete steps that things come they come in these packages of these discrete step, steps that on some level there is this this quantum limit there's this level that we can reach where we can't get any smaller and everything's built of building blocks which are either this size or smaller and yes. that size is uh, uh, uh what, would we, what would we call that up uh, uh h bar over two yeah, so H bar speak. over two. Well, H bar, which is H, H bar. over two pi. Yeah, that's right. Yep, that's Planck's constant over that's two pi. Right. So it's basically Planck's constant divided by uh, the circumference of a circle. Right, the circumference of a circle. Mm -hmm. So, and so, and, and so, uh, with this um, uh, idea, he he didn't like it, but Einstein actually took it to the next step. He in 1905, in his miracle year of you know, relativity theory and all sorts of other wonderful new stuff, he understood, hey, this little chunk is actually describing chunks of energy. It really is. Let's just take that at face value. 
And from his chunkification of energy, we he predicted something called the photoelectric effect, which is the reason why I have, you know, the reason why this little light works here is because of this little solar panel here. This solar panel is what what Einstein invented in 1905, namely the photoelectric effect, which is to say that that particles of light hit this particularly novel um, device and it produces a stream of electrons. Now, if light were continuous, then as it's hitting this board, it would produce a continuous stream of electrons at many different uh, uh, currents, many different velocities. Right. But it doesn't happen that way. No. Nope. Because light is discrete, it literally unleashes the electrons here to produce a certain current at a certain moment. No current before and only a current after when the certain frequencies, the right frequency, the right chunkification of light hits this board. So the point is that we know just by virtue of this, that light does come in chunks, um, like little candy bars that kids eat. You know, it's not melted candy bar, it's chunks. So if you don't want your kid to get energized, don't feed them the chunks. Okay. Well, another thing that are really interesting, uh, solar panels, uh, solar technology is something I really, I keep up on. I post every type, every time there's a new idea or breakthrough in any type of solar technology, I post it. Because in, in addition to uh, those, those few light waves which are um, absorbed and actually go into producing energy inside that yes. uh, circuit. There, there's also reflection, there's That's also right. refraction, there, there's, right. there's lots of other things. Um, one of the interesting uh, things I saw recently was they, they created this um, uh, body, it was almost like a black body, it absorbs uh -huh. like 99.999% of all the light that hits it, like it only, it only um, reflects or, or um, expels like a, a very small portion of the light that hits it. And sort of that that sort of concept, uh, I think they made it out of car carbon nanotubes, I believe. Right, uh, I, I saw that. Mm -hmm. And perfect, almost the perfect black body. And that that idea is, I think, really interesting because that's the sort of concept you'd need, or, or the structure you'd need to build a super efficient solar device or or, or a, a solar collection um, material. Uh, whether that be the paint that they paint on the um, that tower in the middle of the field with the uh, with all the uh, reflectors, or or whether they make some sort of, uh, I was even talking about different types of metamaterials or, yes. uh, you know, materials that, that can absorb or um, re redirect light in, in certain ways uh, the, of, of, of the specific frequency that you're looking for. You know, it depends on the structure uh, the, in the, the spaces between the atoms that has to match the wavelength of the light that you want to pick out. That's but right. um, I had this idea like you could basically build a collector uh, that would, uh, be like a black body that would s absorb all the electromagnetic radiation that hits it and then s redirect that somehow that you could get more super efficient solar panels because right now solar is efficient it's 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 good and it's getting better but it's still expensive as hell and it's i don't know it's it's not like it's not like the ready solution it can't it, it can't it, it's starting to compete with oil in some places with as far as energy costs and prices go but um it's got it still like has its problems and its issues and that's the same thing with uh wind power and and some of these other uh ideas but um again the light light does these weird things uh that, that we learned about in when i took uh, advanced uh, enm that you really get into more, less you know more of the electromagnetic field uh how to how to do the wave equation um different types of angles uh like also like dipole radiation and, That's right. and, and and things like why is the sky why is the sky blue and it's not it's not just because it has actually a lot to do with quantum mechanics that that That's these right. the, these the, the the way that the um the atoms in the upper atmosphere are absorbing light and then and then um only emitting certain types that it, it somehow it works out to that frequency if you run the calculations that in that blue range of spectrum that that's why the sky is blue because of these quantum mechanical properties and also uh, things like um, why polarization, polarized glasses work to to get the glare off of looking at uh, water. You know, when you when you're looking at, at a reflection off the surface of a water, when you wear polarized glasses, you can see right into the water. You don't get the glare. Uh, right. A lot of fishermen use them because they can see right into the water and see the fish easier. And yeah. uh, that has to do with the surface of the water being this way, and some of those lights, the the light bouncing off, and and um, all the light that's polarized this way sort of uh, bounces off a lot better than the light that or the light that's polarized this way you know uh, parallel to the water rather so it's, I, it's uh 
I thought that, that was advantage. really interesting. And also like things like Brewster's angle. The, that's, that's right. Just this weird angle that pops out of nowhere and has this weird uh, total absorption property that if you if you approach things at that angle, you get total absorption. You get total, exactly. And, and, and um, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's actually kind of phenomenal that, you know, you do have these different regimes in which you can use um, sort of the standard Maxwell's equations for quantum, uh, for, for light, or you have to go to um, uh, quantum field theory in order to predict what light's going to do. And that's what you're talking about with uh, trying to find either total absorption or total reflection. Um, uh, and so um, I, I had a, um, a graphic, but, um, but, but it is, um, the, the one thing that we found out in physics is that um, you can make your life a lot easier if you have different domains that you're talking about, different interactions. So as you're saying, you know, when, when light is actually, when you really want to understand how light interacts with matter, then you go to the quantum mechanical domain. But if you really just want to have a more broad sense of what light is doing, like through a prism, then you go to the electromagnetic, electromagnetic or Maxwell, I would say, domain of understanding. Yeah. Also, uh, like, same thing with, yeah. Signals intelligence and, and, and um, just getting different types of signals um, and, and sending those and broadcasting them, like what Tesla f was first experimenting with when he was, you know, building these uh, antenna arrays and, and trying to absorb, uh, trying to, you know, build the first radar systems and, and really a cutting edge experimenting with a lot of these uh, ideas that led to the invention of radio that are, allows us to broadcast on all these different frequencies and that. You can listen to one thing on by tuning into one station versus another, even though um, all those frequencies are passing or, or, or vibrating the electrons in, in, in any piece of metal. It's just about tuning into those, those specific frequencies in order to listen on that on that frequency. And um, really cool thing, yeah, like you were you were saying, you have to break things down in terms of scale from the big to the small, and it's the same way with the electromagnetic spectrum. You have uh, super long waves, EL, ELF, extremely low frequency waves, and you also have uh, extremely high frequency waves like gamma gamma waves and whatnot, and, um, and those interact with all different things on different scales and different levels, and uh, there's some really interesting things if you look at the, the frequency mapping charts that uh, show you uh, the breakdown of the whole electromagnetic spectrum and what frequencies are designated for, you know, broadcast radio, uh, police band, you know, um, the secret government band that they, they block from those scanners that you get. At, at, you know, That's right. There's a couple frequencies that are blocked out of those, and you can actually, if you know the electronics, you can hack in and unblock those and listen in on frequencies they don't want you to listen to. <laughs> and <That's right. laughs> Stuff like that. But it, it's, it's interesting, the knowledge that you can get, and it's all based on quantum mechanics. It's all based uh, around the turn of the century with the theory of quantum physics. And, That's uh, right. So we're seeing some visualizations here on on your screen that that are at least popping up for me. Um, can you, this so, looks so like polarization. These are that's polarized. All we're talking about. That's right. Yep. Polarization of light and how, I mean, we understood polarization to a certain degree through just Maxwell's equations, but quantum mechanics gives you, as you're saying, a special you know uh, brink into polarization. So on the left hand side of the screen, where you have the light that's being completely blocked. By, by the polarizer, um, if you understand the, the quantum mechanics even better, you can get, instead of it just being blocked, you can get it to be perfectly reflected or uh, perfectly absorbed um, by the material. But whichever way you do it, it's being blocked. So I definitely agree with you. I just wanted to show some graphics that I have. Um, and, um, okay, so let me bring it back to, to me here. I think I can do this. There we go. Um, there you are. Yep. Sorry, this is uh, still a little intensity. Okay, so <laughs> don't worry about me. Okay, I'll figure right. this out. But but the bottom line is that um, I'm going to put some more graphics. So this is just a graphic of of a polarizer plate, but this doesn't say anything really about what. Uh, the material you need to make it out of on a, it obviously right. it wouldn't look like this on on a quantum mechanical level. It, it doesn't quite look like that. The polarization, a polarized uh, lens. I do. If you were to look at it under a microscope, I guess it's like little scratches that are uh, mm -hmm. all aligned in the same uh, direction. Which um, they sort of are, are these slits that let let light through if it's 
if it's in uh, if it's in alignment with uh, the slits. But if it That's if right. they're out of alignment or or um, counter to it, it, it won't let anything through. That's right. It won't and, let that that the, the field through. And the field that we're you know we're talking about the electric field specifically, but you know you can certainly have um, uh, polarizers uh, that deal with the magnetic field, which is a very strange um, way of thinking about it, but. Um, but you can have that as well. Um, right, like for instance, gold atoms, um, apparently they have a, a negative permeability, but a positive, it's, it, 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 which causes that, that, um, that yellowish luster. It actually comes right. from the quantum mechanical properties of how those gold atoms are um, interacting with electromagnetic fields. That's right. And I thought and that, that was uh, very interesting. And it's really right, I, and I agree. And, and one of the, the the breakthroughs in the last twenty years, uh, speaking of negative stuff, is the negative index of refraction. Okay? Yes, metamaterials. Yeah. Metamaterials, you got it, and that's what you were mentioning before. Um, and, and that's just a brilliant breakthrough because you don't ever believe if you're just looking at classical uh, electromagnetism that you can actually create this kind of material. It does require quantum mechanics in order to get to that negative index of refraction. Um, and I know that at the University of, of Maryland, um, you know, it's, it's a hot topic um, because mm -hmm. it has so many, so many applications. Um, but, um, but going back to, um, to quantum mechanics, I'm just clicking off some of those things. Um, going back to quantum mechanics, um, that whole notion that there's a, um, a wave notion um, to, to to particles and to light. So, so one of the controversies at the turn of the century is: is matter is light a wave or is light a particle? And um, because of Einstein, before Einstein, we just thought it was a wave. After Einstein in 1905, we realized: oh my God, it's a particle. But because of quantum mechanics, we realized: hey, it's both. It's a wave in some circumstances and a particle in other circumstances. And what do you do with that? And it's, so that's never, never sat well with me, that whole idea. I, I really think that it is, it is waves, but the particle nature just comes out from something else. There's some other physics that are going on there that we don't yet understand that knocks that electron off or where that photon comes from when the electron drops in an orbital. I, that's my personal interpretation, although I have, don't have the theory or the math to really prove it just yet. Anyways, we're going to take a quick commercial break right now. We're at the half minute mark, and uh, we'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Rep your area code. MarioPablo.com You're watching the Zadalza Entertainment Network on, on ZenLive.tv. Here, you'll find ridiculously good-looking people equipped with knowledge, intellect, and passion for speaking the truth. Does it get any sexier? A filtered mind is the only crime for Zen Live. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. All right, we are back from our break um, here on Zen Live TV. Um, again, talking about quantum physics and sort of the uh, modern theory of of you know where physics kind of branched off from Newtonian physics into this whole another realm of this quantum limit that gave us cell phones, computers, radio, um, all the really awesome technologies we have today, and and also the technologies we're going to be using in the future like uh, super efficient solar cells and um, phones that can um, bend in half and and um, all these <laughs> weird material properties that, that we're gonna have in the future um, the metamaterials the invisibility cloaks uh, all that sort of technology came from um, this theory and the development of it and it's really an interesting theory because it doesn't make sense it uh it gives us a lot of useful predictions and a lot of useful answers and allows us to calculate th and things that we can measure and um verify with experiment but it just the whole foundation of quantum mechanics just doesn't sit well with a lot of people including myself and um 
the whole uh, dual particle wave particle duality. I've always thought that um, that yes, I think waves make a lot of sense. It makes more sense to think of these things as waves, and that the particle nature of these things needs to come out of of uh, some other understanding of the physics. Like what we were talking about a little bit last week, which uh, I think a lot of people really like that idea. Um, the idea that light is uh matter is actually trapped light in some yes. in some respects like we talked yes. about particle pair production and pair, annihil pair annihilation with uh positron and, and uh electron pairs uh, basically doing this dance of death and then somehow they unravel themselves from the space time that they're wound up in and spit out photons and um and the whole idea of that Einstein's uh, E equals mc squared has that speed of light term in there, square uh, the c squared term in there. Why is there? Why is the speed of light term inside of mass, mat, and and you know the energy of matter? Um, there's got to be some sort of connection there. And I pointed out, you know, well, yeah, pi r squared. That's uh, the, that's the you know that's a circle. So you have uh, sort of the idea that light tr being trapped in in a circle or tied in a knot somehow that that could be the description of what matter really is if we were to basically find a way to mo model those fields um, more more exactly because the, what they're finding out about um, quantum mechanics uh, if, if you look at um, I have a couple pictures here um, that we can show the uh, the standard mar model of, of particles uh, Susie yes. particles here I got this uh, I got this image of what's called the physicist quant um, periodic <laughs> table um, and it's got quarks on there, yes. and that, that everything is made up of these quarks, including uh, electrons, uh, protons. They're all mostly up and down quarks. There are these other quarks, like the charm and strange, and the uh, top and bottom quark. But um, the most important ones are the up and down and the anti up and anti down quarks, and of course the um, electron, which is a, 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 a lepton, it's a separate particle. Um, and it, they're really interesting that uh, that these this is the physicist periodic table of elements that we sort of go by, and um, it's based on observation of uh, from particle accelerators and high energy nuclear physics that has That's been right. done over the past you know since we've been building particle accelerators, and um, and a lot of the work going doing, going on with the finding the search for the Higgs boson um, to fit the standard model with um, what's going on with CERN and Fermilab. Yeah, and so um, the standard model comes about um, simply, uh, you know, basically as, as you stated it, um, in our exploration of what's going on at the atomic level, we, you know, obviously had to realize that electromagnetism is what's keeping the electron in its orbit around the nucleus, but it didn't stop there. Now we wanted to know what, why the heck is the nucleus, what is it and why is it stuck together? And right. that's where the strong and the weak nuclear forces come from. Because if, if we believe, for example, that, the, and, and measurements indicate this, that the, that the protons are positively charged things, then how is it the two positively charged things that should be blasting themselves apart are stuck together inside of uh, inside the nucleus? And right. so the strong nuclear force comes about to explain that. Um, and, and, uh, and so, you know, through experimentation, we have been led to these understandings that we've required mathematics uh, to, to also help us to understand because we want to predict. We don't just want to go into the lab and, and start accidentally creating nuclear material. We want to be able to predict what's going to happen before we blow ourselves up to smithereens. <clears throat> this is the reason why we created the atom bombs, you know, whether that's good or bad, but that's how we were able to do it. It's because we actually had the mathematical language uh, to do it with. <clears throat> so, um, so the, the notion of the standard model is, is really coming about uh, because of that. Um, um, so I just stopped the animations there, but that, that's the yeah. whole reason why we have the standard model is because of all of the experimentations that have taken us in these directions that we did not know or didn't even want to believe were there. We just, you know, I mean, so when you hear that Nikola Tesla did not believe uh, <clears throat> that there was any substructure to the atom, meaning that, you know, there was no nuclear, any protons, neutrons, and that sort of stuff. That's my understanding of what he believed. There's, there's an obviousness to that belief system. But when you actually do the actual research, there is a core structure there. And we can pull it apart. 
And, uh, and, and so we are always, quantum mechanics is the tool that seems to always be forced on us. Not that we're dreaming it up on our own, we kind of are now, but it's really something that's so tied to experiment that it's, it's somewhat unbelievable. Okay, how tied to experiment the development of quantum mechanics has been. But, but it's interesting that most of our technology is mostly concerned with just the electron and the electron's right. interactions. It's That's really right. all this sub quantum uh, physics, like uh, pulling protons apart into quarks or getting two giant pro protons and, and getting them up to almost the speed of light in these particle accelerators and then smashing them together inside a tiny little room full of detectors, like they do right. at, at CERN and some of these other things. That that sort of yeah, it's interesting for our understanding of physics and looking at all these particle tracks and trying to figure out what and reconstruct what is happening and what these things are made out of and and finding these uh, quarks, breaking these things apart and to to release the quarks uh -huh. for for even brief periods of time that at least so we can see them and and know that they exist and know what's going on. But most of the technology, most of what Tesla built, was all just the electron and 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 Got studying it. just what's going on with the electron and. You got it. Mm -hmm. it it really is. I mean, most of our technology is just really concerned with the electron. I, I haven't really, I don't really know of any technologies, so to speak, that have come out of like, you know, in-depth particle physics that don't really just deal with the electron. I don't know. Well, and perhaps okay. you I know mean, some. For, for the most part, you're right in the sense that, you know, the vast majority of our technology is built around electrodynamics. That is absolutely right. But, you know, um, the, the whole nuclear aspect to it, you know, in the weak nuclear process that allows us to create uh, fission technologies and, you know, our submarines and, and our nuclear power plants and all that stuff and how the sun works and when should the sun die and should we even be worried about it and all of that stuff. So that's where, you know, the nuclear physics comes into place. And that's where we learn by astronomy whether or not, to a certain degree, our nuclear physics actually works because we can kind of predict when stars go nova. You know, right. we can kind of predict, you know, um, um, uh, how long does the red giant phase of a star last so that, you know, um, it will be a key indicator as we look out and try to figure out, you know, how far away is a galaxy. Actually, we don't use red giants, but, but we do use Cepheid variables, and those Cepheid variables rely on an understanding of nuclear mechanics. Um, and also the reason why we actually have metals like uranium and stuff like that, where do they come from, right? Because technically speaking, you know, a star is not necessarily cooking up uranium on its interior. Where does it come from otherwise? Well, because of the, you know, the shock wave due to a uh, supernova explosion creates those additional materials, et cetera, right. et cetera. So it, 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 even, even for the most part, even though it doesn't deal most with Most general us, stars, they, 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 they go from hydrogen, when all the hydrogens burn to helium, then, the right. then it starts another reaction where the helium goes to the next heavier element, the lithium, and then blah, 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 blah. But then it reaches a point where it gets to iron. That's right. And it, and it just sort of stops. It stops. And That's then right. either it either just stays there and cools off over billions of years or it or it implodes on itself and does the supernova thing, which That's is those right. supermassive stars, which I thought was the biggest. I mean, that was that was from Carl Sagan's Cosmos when I read that. It just gave me this whole, I remember I was like in high school and uh, gave me this whole different respect or understanding of the universe that we are all stardust and we're all made of star stuff. And <laughs> I love that uh, that um, auto-tune song they did with Carl Sagan. Where <laughs> we are star stuff and we are stardust. And uh, it's good. I thought that was genius. <laughs> But, um... Yeah, and, 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 you know, and, and today, you know, even beyond that stuff, we're finding out that by probing even smaller, like quantum gravity small, right? Yep. By probing even smaller, we're finding out, holy mother of you know what, this whole, it's describing the whole universe. Right, so it, and we're what, finding links between quantum mechanics and cosmology, which is that's like... right. Is, In fact, is... Juan Malsadina one of the big shots in quantum gravity and string theory and all of that stuff. I mean, he just turned the whole super string community around when he discovered something called ADS slash CFT, which is a correspondence between gravity on the big cosmological scales and what we call quantum field theories that describe, you know, the quarks and, and the, the weak nuclear particles and the electrons and all that stuff. So he discovered that there was an actual real link between these two extremely different domains. So in the mathematics, if you can understand the easy, let's say the, the, the big stuff is easy to, to do mathematically, 
then that gives you insight into what's really going on on the quantum field level. Or if you can do an easy mathematical thing on the quantum field level, it understands, you can understand what's happening with black holes and what, you know, near the, the event horizon of a black hole, where the right. mathematics is way too complicated to actually solve so easily. So, um, so we have found, and, and just to give you a perspective, the question, why, how do you get this correspondence? Let's put it this way. If you keep dropping, let's say that you create a black hole from very, very little bit of matter, okay? You can actually do that. But that black hole, by virtue of Hawking radiation, will annihilate, it will blow up, it will disintegrate into, into radiation very quickly. But there is a space where the black hole is so big, so macroscopic to us, um, that it's actually functioning, but it's functioning like an atom, it's functioning like a particle. And so this is a perspective that we've only begun to realize uh, in, in physics, where the very, very smallest aspects of, of nature can actually impact macroscopic things. And so that's how we've been able to, to take it so much farther, the ADS-CFT. And I, I would encourage anybody watching this to, to look into Juan Malsadina and to see what sort of work he's been doing, what people have been saying about him, um, because he's... he's He's done something to super string theory that nobody ever thought possible. Um, and for all of us in quantum gravity. Um, so not to, not to get away from the point, but it's the idea that we're, we're really finding that the measurements that we make on the small level are actually impacting our huge understanding. Oh, let me give you another version, which is when we take a snapshot of the early universe, like the Hubble telescope or some of the better telescopes, we actually have a snapshot um, of the microwave background radiation that's seething through the universe, meaning that we can look at the distribution of temperatures at the time about, I guess it's like 10,000 years after the Big Bang, but we can look at the distribution of temperatures, which we consider a snapshot of the baby universe. And we see that that snapshot actually gives us how the galaxies formed and where they formed. So there, there's a... Um, uh, another sort of signature that the very small and the very large are actually connected in physics. So again, the, the baby universe, which originated because of quantum mechanics, right? If we just in our head, like the you know, three minutes uh, from Steven first Weinberg minutes, and, yeah. and, and Glashow, if we imagine that the universe, what, what happened after the first three minutes after the Big Bang? Well, obviously it was all quantum mechanical crap going on, right? There were protons and neutrons and they were flying around with photons and the universe was really small. However, because of inflation or because of expansion, the universe gets really big really quickly. But all of those characteristic things that are going on at the small level don't easily um, get randomized as the universe expands. There's no randomization, which basically means it's, it, the structure at the very smallest level is captured by the structure at the very longest level of our universe. So when we look at it at the nighttime sky, and we ask, why are those galaxies over there? And why is there empty space over here? It's because when the universe began to inflate, that's how it looked with respect to particles. And that, that structure got you know, expanded or inflated into the big universe. That's our understanding. Um, and it works. It actually seems to work. In fact, we call that stuff conformal field theory, where the very small structure gets mapped onto the very large universe. But um, so... We're learning today that quantum mechanics actually really impacts the macroscopic and the cosmological universe in a way that we never really thought possible in the 1950s and the 1960s. But now we know, oh my goodness, it's really there. And people like Mal Decina, who have you know, made correspondences, uh, calculation correspondences between the two levels, allows us to talk about theories called holography. OK, mm -hmm. the idea that everything inside of the universe is just like a painted picture on the macroscopically large universe. That's how that comes about. So uh, so the idea, for example, that that energy is really trapped inside of a circle, a circle, the uh, pi r squared that you were talking about before is, is kind of reminiscent of that idea that rest, the area of that idea. circle and the energy structure are, are linked. So geometry is linked to, to matter content in a way that we just didn't really think. Uh, there's um, another interesting paper that I, I can't think of the, the title of it offhand, but I'll try to find it. I'll put it in the description. It describes um, 
the rest mass energy you, you can get actually if you take the mass and, and take, calculate the energy required to pull that from the edge of the universe into that point in existence, that it, it happens to also equal the rest mass energy. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So that, that's another quantum mechanical cosmological link. Um, that's right. That's it, it's, right. It's interesting. But I also think at the same time, um, the quantum, mechanic theory, quantum mechanics, the theory we have, there are holes in it. There's so much room for new discovery and new theories uh, um, and also new ideas for, for how these things work. I, I just, I'm just look at all these things like um, the wave particle duality we talked about before. Um, and all these things that that um, the where does the photon come from? How do the right. how does how does this uh, how does this sort of interaction happen? I think that there are answers that to that that that. No, I, did. I completely agree with you. That's that, that's what I work on is really finding those sorts of answers that are way outside of the box. But okay. there's pieces of the puzzle too that that I I also feel like um, that maybe people have been blinded to, especially in the physics community, in the mainstream scientific community, and um, especially with regards to nuclear interactions and and, and nuclear uh, nuclear physics. And uh, one of the big things that I, I I have been an advocate of and try to tell people about uh, with very minimal success, unfortunately, <laughs> is. Uh, is the whole um, the breakthroughs that have been happening and the theories that, and, and the really the experiments that have come out with uh, with um, the the whole uh, cold fusion, cold fusion uh, exactly. the whole cold fusion community. I mean, 25 years later, it's not dead. There's all these scientists all over the world risking their careers and then coming out being like, no, we're measuring this. It, we're not mismeasuring heat. We have not been mismeasuring heat for 25 years. Yeah. There's something more going on that the modern theory that uh, this Coulomb barrier, uh, nuclear um, archaic uh, theory of, you know, that was put forth in the, the whole uh, this paper on uh, stars and, and uh, that that was written that basis the basis of uh, nuclear uh, energy theory and stuff that, that there's something more going on here in our experiments there's there's some other innate structure to these fields and there's mathematics there that describe how these fields interact with matter that we don't quite understand yet there's something going on there that's causing this phenomenon that's causing fusion in these reactions they're getting fusion byproducts they have they have particle tracks in CR thirty nine. Uh, they have all these things. Like I went to the MIT colloquium in uh, in March, and also the, uh, the the IEP course there in January. And I met these guys. I, I I talked to them. I watched. I filmed the lectures and posted them up online. I'm actually gonna maybe post a couple more and stuff. There's there's a lot more good ones, man. I I really gotta go and and get get more of them together. And I really want to get some of those guys on. Unfortunately, they're they view me as a media. I'm, I'm like the media to them, and they're very reluctant to talk to people like me because that's not really how science is done. They're they're really looking just hey, just read our papers and do your own experiments is what they say. You know, I tried to get them a lot of those guys for interview requests and stuff, and I'm actually maybe thinking about making a whole documentary just on the field of cold fusion from a, a more scientific perspective. There's been a, several documentaries made about cold fusion, not all of them very good and. Even the videos I've made in the past, my understanding of the field has just grown enormously from going to those conferences and actually, you know, watching the lectures and learning about this. But I think that's just so amazing that there's this physics that's going on there. 25 years of experimentation, the field's not dead. It's not, um, it's not been completely discredited as so many people are, have been led to believe by the mainstream media and even, even um, academic circles. It's sort of... Um, that's a thing that I run into so much, even with, with intellectuals. It's so easy yes. to trick intellectuals because they think they know everything. They think they, they know it all already. And uh, they, they sort of prey on this whole, uh, the whole thing that you fool yourself. We, can't, we consistently fool ourselves as scientists. Got it. You all got the time. It. And, and, and we're led down paths or, or led away from things that have been huge discoveries that like for hundreds of, hundreds of years, people were like, no, don't, don't look at that. That's not, that's not the way it works. You know the the earth the, the universe revolves around the earth. The, this geocent heliocentric model is is ridiculous. Uh, you know all these things that have been proven through through history of science that we're we're misled by ourselves. Or the the we are the easiest our, ourselves are the easiest to fool of, of anything. Right. It's it's uh it's sort of it's interesting watching how this sort of this anytime you mention this field to people they're like oh that's completely discredited or or they'll go into you know, you get Thunderfoot. Um, like he's he's got some nuclear engineering background. He does a whole bunch of videos on it where he's just like, 
a lot of lot of colorful language, but really not looking at any any sort of anything in detail. Right. Uh, it's show me the science, right? Show me the measurements, and you can show the measurements through you know what they've done. Read those the papers. Can, yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 that's really the important part, right? Uh, the idea is that it's a paradigm shift from what we believe so much in to something that seems to be beyond belief, even though it's not. Because right now, for example, with, with this, the work that we do, it's, it's emergent phenomenon. These are not things that may be there on the, the most right. basic level, but it's happening because of a synergy between this dynamic and this dynamic over here that you couldn't have easily predicted. But the results are there. So the and, idea... Mm -hmm. And it's not just about like a lot of people think uh, the, the energy, the getting uh, a f energy source like what what cold fusion would. They're so caught up in that. They're 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 really uh, the engineering and that that kind of stuff is is really hard to get into. Um, right. But I think there's physics there that people should be paying attention to, or at least trying to understand better, because there is something going on there uh, that causes this to happen. There is an innate structure to matter that we're just beginning to understand with these sort of you know, packing these things in these crystal lattices and then and then vibrating in with these super waves of uh, multiple frequencies all built up and they seem to resonate and cause these resonances that are self-propagating and, and continue the reaction. And there's some there's something going on in there if you, if if I really don't have a lot of time to talk about it all, all in detail here, but I, I have videos on that and I have uh, a couple things on that. But I really think that there's more to understand about quantum mechanics and the nature of matter and how it interacts with the electromagnetic fields and everything else that they're, they're really not, we don't have the full picture, but it's such a beautiful time in physics because you have, it's such an interesting paradox too because you have all these people that are convinced that, that they're not looking at these uh, pieces of the puzzle because they've been convinced that that whole field is discredited and anyone associated with it is quackery and quack science and they, they're want, they don't want to risk their careers and reputations just like Galileo and all these other people had to do That's to, right. to go against the church and, and, and break through that dogmatic belief systems. Einstein had to do it too. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Every Every major scientific revolution, you know, the the book on the nature of scientific revolutions that's a big popular one i still haven't i still need to buy that and read that uh coon coon yeah that's coon exactly yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> that's thomas coon thomas coon that's yeah cool. and um k u h n right yeah that's and, right k u h n uh, so yeah the nature of scientific revolutions and he points out that there's there's uh there's this blind we blind ourselves to new new pieces of the puzzle. we're not looking at the pieces of the puzzle because we've been so systematically brainwashed against them that it, it sort of blinded us from the pieces of the puzzle that could lead us to the better solutions and and it's it's so funny that even the greatest minds this sort of trickery works just the same Every it works just as, especially when their careers are on the line. That's yes. exactly right. Or funding. So, <laughs> that's right. The that's funding, exactly. Even more so. <laughs> even more so. And I just wanted to point out, so the, the two major things that, that um, quantum mechanics does give us is measurement should be aligned with the mathematics and that entanglement, which we didn't really cover here, is also a very huge thing that we're discovering as to why quantum mechanics is quantum mechanics and why we have to now look at it in, in this new way of entanglement and the whole also that, has like that cosmological link too because you got to think of like particles and antiparticles and that everything in the universe is all connected in that's some right. one big mathematical equation that's producing it the the, 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 right. the dynamic equation if we had the big bang obviously we're all in the same place at the same time in the same space there's we something, were before you know so we're all entangled <laughs> <laughs> right. We all came from that same fundamental uh, driving or, or rep, rep, reciprocating equation that produced this. Uh, that I think it. I think it's a fractal because there's so many things in nature which uh, fractals are useful for understanding. That we we really think that nature is a fractal in and of itself. Um, I mean, just from the quantum mechanical level, this idea of things orbiting, kind of like looks like uh, stars orbiting and then you know planets orbiting a star and then the stars all orbiting galactic central point um, there's sort of this whole interesting dynamic of rotation and, uh, and and spin that that is sort of at the heart of what the universe is made of and, um, and still so let, me, yep. let me just say Renee Lal is um, uh, an academic physicist working on quantum gravity who agrees with you that the dimensions of space are actually a fractal dimension. It's not actually three. 
it's something like 2.9 whatever but it's a fractal dimension and so that's what her work in, in quantum gravity gives as well and it also gives the, the same sort of structure that it's interesting because uh, like as we pointed out um in one of the other shows we talked about e8 the theory and why that predicts the it gives us these things that look like uh particle physics it gives us that's all right. the particles and stuff why e8 and why not other structures other group structures why is it that one specifically and i was I sort of uh, thought about it as like four dimensional, but looking in a mirror, like that four kind of multiplies by itself and to create eight or something. But I really, I don't know if I'm just completely way off in that. I have, I sort of have this whole theory of uh, the universe starting from this point of nothingness yes. and that it's, it's like a hollow mirror sphere, like reflected in, in all the dimensions of space and time are reflected out infin infinitely. And that somehow liveness called those gonads. Gonads. Leibniz. Leibniz is the guy who created calculus, the integral calculus. I know who Leibniz is. Yeah. Okay, so he called them gonads or <coughs> gonads. Believe it or not, I, I swear to you. Gonads. Um, and, uh. <laughs> so, so definitely, uh, I'll I'll send you some links to that as well. Um, but it's an idea, and also it's it's come about from Hawking and Hartle. The Hawking-Hartle equation of the universe is essentially what you're saying: something starting out of nothing. So what we call a conformal field theory to gravity. So that came about in like 1984. Um, and if you look that up, it's string theory and all of that stuff, but it's, it's Stephen Hawking and some guy named Hartle. Um, so, so yeah, those are Find ideas. Find me a link. We'll post, I'm going to post links to all this stuff. So you people, lots of interesting reading. I mean, if you really want to learn stuff and, and really expand your mind, I mean, this is, this stuff is, I mean, it goes beyond sports or uh, <laughs> info <laughs> you know, like whatever you have you. We got a, we got a minute left, so um, let's try to wrap it up on uh, some sort of note. And um... okay, so consciousness is what all this stuff also will lead to. Yes. But, but but the idea also is that whatever math you have has to give you the measurable results. Measurement and math have to go together, and that's what quantum mechanics. That's is what right. math's all about. It's it you don't. The only reason we have math is to quantify things and actually, you know, show numbers. And yes. it's sort of, yeah, like we said before, it's, it's sort of we're pissing in the wind, but at least we have we have better aim than you know That's the other right. people. So. <laughs> That's right. But anyways, thanks for a great show today again, Ken. And um, I'd love to have sure. you back on. And and unfortunately, we didn't get any calls today. But hey, maybe maybe we'll get some more people and encourage them to call in every Saturday, four to five p.m. is when I run my show. If you want to talk to us. Call in Saturday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'd love to hear from you, get some, answer some of your questions and get you on. Um, thank you very much for watching, and uh, have a great weekend.